Pizza Tower is a 2D platformer with a lot to love. From the addictive movement to the unique art style to the absolutely killer soundtrack. But today we're going to be taking a look at what might be my favorite aspect of the game, the level design. So for this video, I'm going to be showing my love for this stellar indie title by ranking all 20 levels from my least favorite all the way up to my favorite, all while separating them into tiers based on Pizza Tower's iconic letter ranking system. But before we begin, there are a few disclaimers I have to make for this ranking. Firstly, this is just my own opinion, so please don't take it personally if your own favorite level is lower on the list. I spent a lot of time considering different ranking placements and replaying the levels to gain a better understanding of what makes them tick, but ultimately this list is still heavily subjected to my own unique biases and preferences. If you want your own voice to be heard regarding these stages then please feel free to leave your opinions on them in the comments because I'd love to hear your thoughts. All I ask in return is that you keep things civil down there. My second disclaimer is that I'm only ranking the levels this time around, so that means the 20 stages where Peppino runs around like a madman and collects various food related items. No bosses. If this video does well enough, I might do a separate ranking of the bosses in a future video. Third, and most importantly, I'd like to issue a huge spoiler warning. And this isn't just your average everyday spoiler warning either. I went into this game relatively blind and had an absolute blast. But I'd wager that if I went in knowing what all the levels were beforehand, it wouldn't have been quite as much fun for me. So with that in mind, if you're able to, then I highly recommend actually playing through the game first before watching the rest of this video. Go ahead, pause the video and go enjoy yourself. I can wait. Oh, you're still here? Well then I guess there's nothing left to do but start the ranking. So grab yourself a slice and sit back because it's pizza time! Boo! You stink! When I think of pizza tower levels that are just completely, unabashedly garbage, and I never ever want to play again, the first level that immediately comes to mind has to be... none of them. Yep, I really don't consider any of the levels to be awful, so we're leaving the D tier empty. On to the next letter. It's, uh, it's, it's not good. You know, I like to think that there's a bit of good in even the bad levels of Pizza Tower. So that's why I ultimately decided to put... Oh, you've gotta be kidding me! There's nothing in here either? Yeah, I don't think there's even a kind of bad level in Pizza Tower, so this C tier gets a rest too. But don't worry, this is the last time I'm doing this gag though, because there is quite a lot I have to discuss in the B tier. Alright. I said, alright. Bombs? You want it? No. Obviously some level had to be the one to come in dead last, and that's where I ultimately decided to place Ancient Cheese, the third level of World 1. This stage is themed around ancient Greek architecture mixed with a bit of mozzarella, and the main gimmicks here are throwable bombs and cheese block platforms that disappear after you stand on them. I did enjoy this level, but more than any other stage in the game, I'd say it definitely feels like something's missing here. I don't know, it just seems to me like the Greek aesthetic is kinda underutilized, and the cohesion between the few gimmicks that actually are present and the level's theming is a bit minimal. What do bombs have to do with ancient Greece anyways? Maybe they should have given Peppino a transformation in this level where he's Zeus and he can like float around on a cloud and shoot lightning. I don't know, just a random idea I had. I did give this level a bit of leeway for being in the first world, but overall I'd say that even by world 1 standards, it's a bit on the forgettable side. The actual gameplay of the level is as solid as ever though, and I especially like the start of the escape sequence because it can be absolutely nerve wracking when you've played for the first few times if you keep falling off the blocks, and it feels really satisfying to finally get it right. So all in all, yes, I did like the ancient cheese, but when there are so many more interesting levels in the game with more creative concepts and better execution, it's a bit hard for me not to see this one as a relic from an age long gone. A very common theme you'll see throughout the lower ranked levels on this list is me saying that I had a good time when playing on them, but there was still some significant caveat that detracted from my experience in some way. 
However, with John Gutter, the only real crime it commits is being the first level of the game, and as such, it's kind of obligated to take it slow and show players the feel of the game without ramping things up too much. But that said, this is a phenomenal first level. There's a lot of straightaways early on where you can build up crazy amounts of speed for free, which really got me hooked on the adrenaline rush of this game's momentum right out of the gate, and I've been chasing that high all throughout my playthrough of the game. Some of the secrets in Jerome are pretty easy to find here too, which is smart because it tells the player, hey, these are a thing, now go find them in the other levels. Plus, the chef tasks for this level are surprisingly some of the hardest in the game, and encourage playing at a level even higher than the average P rank, so this stage really is a one-stop shop for improving at the game and being rewarded for doing so. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the banana peel gimmick. It's a really cute way to introduce the player to the concept of level-specific gameplay elements without being too in your face about it. The music even has a little monkey solo in it, which is a perfect example of how charming this game's silliness can be at its best. All in all, John Gutter is an amazing first level, but I had to put it this low just because of how relatively simple it is, even if that same simplicity is what makes it so successful as an introductory level. It's sad and a little bit confusing, but hey, at least it didn't take last place. So congrats, John Gutter. You beat the first level is worst level allegations. I did it. He did it. And just like that, we move on from the first level in the game to the last one. After the defeat of Pizza Face, Peppino must run back down the pizza tower and save everyone he can before the entire structure collapses. There's no secrets, treasures, or lap 2 to be found here. Just a long list of characters who want to get out just as badly as you do. The entire thing takes place during pizza time, and while the timer is pretty lenient, it's not like you can afford to drag your feet the whole time. This level is essentially just a huge trip down memory lane, with a ridiculous amount of enemies and gimmicks for you to navigate as you traverse down the hub world that you've become very familiar with by this point. It's a great way to close the game, and the sense of speed and urgency throughout the entire sequence is phenomenal, and it's all accompanied by a truly triumphant remix of the pizza time theme. Also, this is a side note, but I just realized as I was writing this that the track's name Bye Bye There is a play on the line Hello There that you hear at the start of every pizza time. That's such a cool little detail. But similarly to John Gutter, as stellar of an ending level as Crumbling Tower of Pizza is, it's a bit weak compared to more orthodox levels just by virtue of what the level is required to do and not do as the final stage of the game. The exploration on Crumbling Tower of Pizza is minimal, and while I wouldn't rather have it any other way considering what this level represents in the larger context of the story, that's still a major caveat that makes me get less enjoyment out of this level than the ones with the usual assortment of collectibles. But again, this is still one of the best ways they could have possibly ended Pizza Tower, and man, does that title card go indescribably hard. Please stop hitting my ribcage with a metal bar! In what I believe might be a pretty hot take, Golf, the final level of World 3, finds itself in the bottom quarter of my ranking. Don't get me wrong, I think this stage is pretty well designed, but in order for someone to really love this one, they've gotta be sold on the titular golfing gimmick. And honestly, I wasn't super into it. Aiming is a bit more restrictive than I would have liked, and more often than not you'll be hitting the ball so far away that it's off screen, making it tricky to predict where Greaseball will ultimately end up. That in of itself isn't too bad, but when paired with those nose guys that can snag your ball from super far away, it can get kind of frustrating. Although I guess that frustration's pretty <laughs> on par. <laughs> with the sport this level is based on. Alright, so if I'm saying all these parts of the level that I didn't love all that much, why is golf not in dead last? Well, there's also a lot to this level that I enjoyed, like the secondary gimmick of the cheese guy who throws you around in ball form. I found it pretty charming. Golf also has some of my favorite secret rooms in the entire game that really make you consider even more possibilities with the gameplay elements this stage introduces. If this level really struck a chord with you, then more power to you. I can totally see why this one has its fans. 
However, both this level and the one directly above it on this list take major risks that fully commit to shaking up the Pizza Tower core gameplay in really creative ways that I appreciate and find interesting, but also don't quite agree with me enough to escape the trenches of this ranking. And speaking of trenches... Oppenheimer style! War is the penultimate level of the game and it has two main gimmicks. A large timer on the bottom of the screen that causes a game over if it hits zero, and a shotgun that Peppino uses to blast anything and everything in his way to Kingdom Come. Your only chance of success is to find the war terminal scattered throughout the level and increase the timer enough to make it to the exit before it's too late. The sense of urgency here is great thanks to cataclysmic visuals and a very heavy backing track. I also like the shift this level takes part of the way through to a factory with a bunch of Peppino clones that can really overwhelm you if you're not precise with your shots. However, much like in real life war, the sacrifices that had to be made to create this unique level are many and not without consequences. For example, there's no escape sequence to be found here because you're in crisis mode right from the start, and this can lead to the level feeling a bit on the short side. War also suffers from the same thing I mentioned with Crumbling Tower of Pizza in that the exploration aspect of the game had to take a massive hit to make this stage work. At least this time, there are still secrets to be found, it's just more about spending your precious time to complete them than actually finding them in the first place. This level does still have a lap too, but you have to do it without the gun, and it honestly feels a bit empty and dull to run back through. Another kind of weird thing about this level is its placement chronologically in the game. I don't think the shotgun gimmick is as cool here as it's intended to be, because the level immediately before this one uses the same gimmick in a way that feels much more satisfying and organic with the pacing of the level. But I'll talk more about what makes that one so great when we get to it later on in the list. Maybe War should have gone with a different weapon like a grenade launcher or something, but that's just a random thought. There's also the fact that this level is placed directly before the final boss, Pizza Face. But since this level doesn't have pizza time, it's one of very few levels in the game where Pizza Face can't chase after you and kill you, and that doesn't make for a very good build up to the main threat. However, it's really not that big of a deal when the rest of the game does a great job of hyping him up. And in spite of my many critiques of this level, the good far outweighs the bad, even if there's not quite as much meat on the bones here as my preferred levels tend to have. War is still a blast, both metaphorically and literally, which is why it's among the highest levels in my B tier. The Scrimblo Male, and 10 signs that you could actually be a Scrimblo Male. If I could summarize the level at the very top of my B tier in just a two word phrase, it would be pleasant enough. I think that really fits the fun farm to a T. When it's good, it can be a lot of fun, but when it's not, it's a slow day on the ranch. This level really takes a while to get going, and the uncharacteristically low energy music doesn't do it any favors either. Sure, this music might match the tone of a peaceful farm environment, but oftentimes Peppino is moving so fast during high level gameplay that it feels almost wrong to have a song this slow backing the action. But thankfully, the level doesn't stay dull for too long because special guest star Mort the Chicken makes for a really fun transformation. He takes a bit of getting used to, but once you figure out how to properly swing on the hangers, his aerial momentum can be really fun to play around with. I'm pretty sure everyone who's played this level remembers their first time finding the Mort Cube. It's such a bizarre but rewarding easter egg. Full disclosure, I didn't even know Mort actually had his own video game on the PS1 until a few days ago. Anyways, another thing that helps Fun Farm pick up steam later on in the level is the music changing to a much more upbeat song. The Firebutt gimmick makes a comeback in this stage, and gameplay wise it's okay, but it feels almost out of place here. Since it's a farm, I almost feel like the cows from Oregano Desert would have fit in better here. But again, when Fun Farm does finally hit its stride, it's absolutely delightful. Just make sure you drank your morning coffee before trying the start of it. But now that we're done having a grand old time down on the farm, it's time to head on down to greener pastures as we kick off the A tier. Hey, that's pretty good. Oh, hear me, King, for I must sing how you are the greatest at everything. Some of you might be surprised to see Pizzascape of all levels placed this high on the list, 
And honestly, I'm right there with you. I did not expect this one to stick with me to the extent that it did. But while John Gutter was the level that got me hooked on this game's momentum, Pete's Escape was the one that got me hooked on the level design. Or at least, it got me really excited about the possibilities. The Night Transformation is a fun one that drives home just how much these moveset changes bring to the table, both with how much they add and subtract from Pepino's usual arsenal. In this case, the Night Transformation gives Pepino the ability to one-hit KO enemies just by touching them, as well as a double jump for more freedom in terms of aerial mobility. However, the trade-off is that Pepino's ground speed is now exponentially slower, and if you want some of your old speed back, you've got to commit to touching a sloped surface, all while jumping over any obstacles that might be in your path. The best transformations in this game are the ones that get you to think about the terrain, enemies, and set pieces around you in a completely different way, and on that end the night is a total success. But that's enough gushing about the level's transformation, because there's a lot else worth loving here, like the natural way the level progresses from being outside the castle, to the interior, and then even to specific rooms like the library and storage room. I'm a huge sucker for when levels tell the story of your journey as you make more progress, so Pizza Escape definitely gets a few extra pizza points in my book for that. The only reason this one didn't make it even higher on the list is because aside from the trademark night gimmick, it's pretty straightforward. Still, it's a total smash hit for being the second level of the game, and is more than deserving of being dubbed the court jester of this ranking's A tier. Moo, like cows. <laughs> a common claim I've seen made about many video games from a wide variety of developers and game genres is that desert levels have a tendency to be boring, but personally I've always been a fan of the archetype ever since I was very young and first played New Super Mario Bros. for the DS. Something about the arid atmosphere and Middle Eastern style music just always seems to hit me the right way, and fortunately Pizza Tower's own contribution to this trend is no slouch either. For the first level of World 2, Oregano Desert has a lot of different themes going on, from tribal dancing, to convenience stores, to spicy chicken, and there's even a spaceship at the very end of the level. I think the totem gimmick might be my favorite one from this stage though, because there's a few areas where you have to be really sure you killed the dancing cheese or else you're almost definitely going to get nailed by the thunder, and I love it when a level's geometry utilizes gimmicks to their full potential. My pick for the biggest loser of this level is probably the fire mouth transformation. I don't feel like it really does all that much that isn't done better by other transformations. Heck, there's even another spicy food transformation that I think is just this idea but executed better in almost every possible way, but we'll cross that bridge a bit later. Firemouth isn't really terrible per se, I do like how it interacts with the TNT blocks. It's just really forgettable because aside from the blocks, there's not a lot of cool stuff you can do with it, and the level doesn't really utilize its abilities all that well. For example, if you're not playing for P-Rank, it can be really easy to not remember that this transformation has a fire burst dash, because the level almost never asks you to use it. So pretty much the exact same thing I just praised the totem gimmick for, but the opposite. The cows are a neat gimmick though, and I like how they usually work in your favor, except for when you enter the spaceship. It gave me the headcanon that all the cows in the UFO have been brainwashed by the aliens, and that's why they're working against you. This also ties into a really cool start for the escape sequence, where Pepino exits the spaceship and gets kicked down the nearby cliff by a bunch of cows. A good deal of the sequence is automated, but it still has a really nice flow to it that made me appreciate the level design a lot more. All in all, this level is a more than solid way to kick off the second world with style, and will definitely bring a huge grin to the face of any desert level apologist like myself. He trades blood for pizza. I knew from my very first playthrough of World 1 that there was something charming about the simplicity of Blood Sauce Dungeon. There's no really super crazy gimmicks here, just never descending labyrinth full of boiling sauce traps and deadly spinning pizza cutters. Many of the areas Pepino traverses here are really narrow and require a working knowledge of the surrounding enemies like the pincers and anchovies, because if you're not familiar with how they attack, then you're probably going to get knocked into the lava. You gotta be even more cautious when the entire screen goes dark later on in the level, as you'll have to start identifying enemies, hazards, and secrets by just their silhouettes, which might not be all that easy for players when it's the fourth level of the game. 
The escape sequence is really cool because scrambling back up the dungeon using wall runs and super jumps is incredibly satisfying, more so than a lot of the horizontal escapes for me. The song for this level, Dungeon Freak Show, really lives up to its name thanks to an utterly bizarre section of it that just sounds completely unrelated to the rest of the theme. Not that I think that's a bad thing, I actually quite like this song and I mostly just find that funny. Just listen to some of this and it'll blow that poppy trash music right out of your head. Wait, wait. Oh man, that's like the best part. Repeat. All in all, Blood Sauce is a really nice take on the vertical dungeon level. That's a good time to just survive initially and becomes even more enjoyable to master as you become better at the game. The king is bad, the king's to blame. He hangs his kingly head in shame. As we close out the bottom half of the list, we return back to a medieval land that's all too familiar to us by this point, except now with a bit of redecorating for Halloween. This game has no shortage of spooky themed levels, but Pizza Scare sets itself apart from the other two by going for a more gothic vibe. This level has two main gimmicks, the first of which, and far and away my favorite between the two, being an exorcist that makes Pepino able to instantly KO any enemy he touches including the normally intangible ghost enemies. It also only lasts a short duration of time, so it does a pretty good job at rewarding players who find ways to build speed and conserve momentum, which is one of the most important core tenets of Pizza Tower. The other quirk this level has is the Ghost King, who possesses a wide array of objects to try and slow Pepino down. No idea why he's so angry at us though, surely it can't be about the time we destroyed this castle back in Pizzascape. There are times in the level where the Ghost King will get stuck in a TV and you'll actually need to free him because his sabotage is indirectly helping you clear the level. One thing Pizza Scare never does that I really would have liked to see is literally the most obvious combination of the gimmicks possible. That being using the Exorcist to finally kill the Ghost King after all the pain he puts you through during the stage. There are other levels we'll discuss later on that have gimmicks or obstacles that are intentionally designed to oppress the player and make them feel powerless, so that when pizza time starts and Pepino is given some sort of trump card to flip the script and defeat the formerly insurmountable threat, it feels all the more satisfying. In fact, that's pretty much an overarching theme of the entire game's plot. The Ghost King and Exorcist felt like the perfect setup for another great level ending like that but it was never actually delivered on. Still, that's just me being wistful about what could have been, and what we actually got in the real pizza scare is solid. The only other real reason why this one isn't higher on the list is because once again, the concept of horror themed levels feels a little overdone in this game, and it definitely seems to me like this particular horror entry doesn't do quite enough to stand out from its competitors. All things considered, Pizza Scare may feel like a bit of a retread with missed potential at times, but the new ideas it does bring to the table still make it a frighteningly good time. Come on, girl. Now here's a level with a lot to love. Between the really well-constructed winding path segments, the impeccable sense of speed thanks to a powerful new gimmick you can ride around on, and the exhilarating time-based challenges that force you to dash for a goal before a top end is sealed away for the entire rest of the stage. So when you put all these aspects together, it really shouldn't come as a surprise that Fast Food Saloon is a delightful level that absolutely deserves its place here in the top half of the ranking. All four of the main gimmicks here are not only well designed, but also complement the Wild West bar theme perfectly. Okay, maybe the timed gates don't really have anything to do with the level theme, but they're still a great addition and have a lot of good synergy with the other gimmicks like the Horsey Race and Weenie Mount. Between the two of them, I definitely prefer the latter, just because it's really clever to have a transformation that grants you instantaneous top-notch speed at the cost of your jump. That's kinda actually how riding a horse works in real life, so it gets bonus points for at least trying to be authentic, all while putting a fun little cartoon spin on it with it being a weenie ride on. But that's not to say that the horsey race was a miss for me either, because I did enjoy it. Mostly I just really like the over the top cheeky expressions the horse has, and especially the look of pure resent he gives you when you beat him. But perhaps the most underrated little trick to this level are the playing cards when you have to turn them all around by running past them, and once you get a flush it gives you a bunch of extra points for each card. 
There's no major collectibles like secrets or Jerome tied to these things, so unless you're playing for rank, you can choose to totally ignore them. And I like it when some gimmicks like this are optional, it can really add to a level sense of freedom. On an unrelated note, this was the level where I first learned to parry thanks to these range shooter enemies that show up a lot early on in the stage. I also used to think they were milk cartons until I looked it up. But yes, Fast Food Saloon is a particularly memorable and enjoyable offering from World 2 that keeps me coming back so often I might as well be a regular there. DD Mega Doo Doo, I'm sorry. And here we have the level whose name you can't say on daytime television. This one's a good example of a stage where there's a lot I have to praise as well as a good amount of things I'm not very fond of. Let's get the bad out of the way first, and I know this take might not go over too well, but honestly one of my biggest issues with Oh Shoot is just how literally crappy it can be. I think it's pretty gross to have these dark brown textures for the ground and blocks you can break through, all while chunks of excrement fly off your feet and there's this nasty squelching sound effect. Don't get me wrong, I know this game's not afraid to be a bit edgy at times, and I actually quite appreciate when it does go PG-13, but the whole poop thing this level has going on isn't really like a cool kind of edgy, it just kinda comes across as disgusting to me personally. My other main problem with this level is the sticky cheese monster gimmick. The actual ability itself is pretty cool, I genuinely enjoy how stiff and molasses like Pepino controls during it, but the issue here is that the transformation feels a bit underutilized. I was really hoping there would be some longer vertical wall scaling segments where you have to stick and time your jumps really carefully, or maybe even wait for a moving platform to come down so you can stick to that, but most of the sticky cheese segments are over and done with in a flash. There isn't even a secret room dedicated to it, they focused on the automated cheese ball sections instead. My one final minor criticism of this level has to do with Mr. Pinch. While I do like what he adds to the stage, I think the actual handling of getting tossed around by him can be a tad finicky sometimes. So if I have all these critiques of the level, how did it manage to get this high? Well, the short answer is the pipe gimmick. Even though this one's ripped straight out of Mario's playbook, the crazy things this level cooks up with the pipes is pretty impressive. Some of my favorite usages of them occur during pizza time, when you have to make quick decisions while running across water or else a pipe will take you back to the start of the segment. There's also a labyrinth of small pipe rooms later on in the escape sequence that's just really pleasing to watch Pepino scurry around in. Another cool thing about O Shoot is the rideable garbage pans. The physics on them feels really fun, and unlike the sticky cheese monster, there are some segments that really put your spacing to the test here and make a pretty simple idea into a fun mechanic by taking full advantage of the pros and cons of sliding around on the trash can lid. So if you take the many fun gameplay wrinkles this sewer has to offer and combine them with a really funky backing track, an absolutely merciless P rank, and a theming choice that makes me just a tiny bit uneasy, you're left with a level that's at least a pretty stinking good time. And to think, this is only the first level from World 4 I've talked about so far in this ranking. That's how you know the slum was an absolute banger of a world. But this does make me wonder, how long will it take before we hit another level from World 4? When I first played through 4-2 The Pepabot Factory, I came out a little disappointed. Like don't get me wrong, I enjoyed the level, but I think that due to my predisposition to get super into mechanical themed stages in games, I went into Pepabot expecting it to be a top 3 level in the game, and it certainly didn't impress me quite enough to hold that honor. But as I played through this stage more and more, it really started to click with me, and I grew to appreciate it in its own right. Half of this level is a vertical climb to get inside the titular factory, and the other half is getting up to wacky mechanical shenanigans with the pizza box transformation among other things. But let's start with the grabby hands first though because there's not a lot to say about them. They're a pretty run of the mill platformer gimmick, but it is cool how some sections make you plan out some really inventive ways to get to Mach 3 before getting grabbed. The coolest usage of them is far and away the end of pizza time, when a hand drags the exit up a little bit further. I love fun last minute surprises like that and this escape sequence really needed that with how otherwise short it felt. Pizza Box is a pretty solid transformation too, although part of me wishes it got a little bit less than 10 jumps, it almost feels overpowered during some of the escape sequence challenges. That's basically a nitpick though. 
Another gimmick in the factory's interior are the conveyor belts, which are another extremely commonly used platformer gimmick, but this level does a good job of utilizing them creatively, so I really don't mind it. Between the industrial setting, conveyor belts, and quasi-vertical layout, this level did call to mind Clockwork Tower from Shovel Knight, but that's not to say it felt like a ripoff by any means. This level still has a lot of its own unique charm to it, as does pretty much every Pizza Tower level. To me, this stage is proof that you don't always need some revolutionary new idea to make a great level, so long as the older ideas you're using are being reimagined in fun and inventive ways. Another awesome thing I love about this level is the secondary song for it, Pepino's Sauce Machine. It's such a catchy and powerful tune that really encapsulates the feeling of a gargantuan factory that never misses a single beat in terms of production speed, despite being operational for countless decades. Pizza Engineer is pretty good too, but Sauce Machine is what truly elevates this stage's music to godly status. Just know that you're going to be hearing me bring up the music more and more frequently the higher we get on this list. Anyways, my one major gripe with this level is actually the secret rooms. One of them is just a single screen puzzle that can be completed in about 5 seconds with zero challenge whatsoever, and another one literally solves itself. The pizza box secret room is pretty good though. However, overall I'd still say this level has the worst secret rooms in the game, but that alone isn't nearly enough to stop this titan of industry from taking the grabby hand straight to the very top of the A tier. It was perfect. Perfect. Everything. Down to the last minute details. Strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. As we move into the S tier, I think it's important that I establish just how highly I think of these levels. In order to make it this high on my list, you have to be virtually perfect, with maybe one or two minor issues, but it can't be anything super noteworthy. There is one level later on that's an exception to this rule of mine, and actually does have quite a few glaring issues with it, but we'll cross that bridge in a bit. Instead, for now, let's discuss the lowest S tier and my rank 7 level, the Waste Yard. This level is a big part of why Pizza Scare didn't get quite that high. I had already been spoiled much earlier on with a spooky level where I enjoyed just about everything more. The Ghost Transformation gimmick is one of my all time favorites, because the gameplay it provides is so unique that it barely even feels like you're playing Pizza Tower anymore. In order to become stronger and faster in the ghost form, you've got to eat some ghost peppers, which is a very clever play on the real life pepper of the same name. It just feels really thrilling to zoom around freely and destroy everything in your path as you slowly gain the ability to break more and more objects around you. Violet Void from Sonic Colors DS anyone? I've seen a few complaints that this transformation feels a bit wonky in terms of handling, and like, yeah, I'd have to agree, but I don't know, it never really detracted from my enjoyment. Even with the slippery controls, I always found this one to be a blast to use. It almost kinda handles like Super Sonic in some of the classic games. Alright, I think I've hit my Sonic comparison quota for this level, so let's move on to the Corp Surfing gimmick, which is a nice little side gimmick that feels perfectly at home in a cemetery level. I don't normally talk about minor enemies during these level reviews, but Gaba Ghouls are actually really neat, because they're a pretty effective skill check. If it's your first time going through this level and you don't have a lot of speed, then you might be a bit confused on how to beat them, but once you learn moves like the Uppercut and Parry, they become much easier to deal with. However, perhaps the coolest part of this stage doesn't actually appear until the escape sequence, because after you kill Pillar John, he comes back to haunt you for the entire rest of pizza time, and getting caught by him sends you back to the start of the room. I've mentioned before how I love it when the escape sequence gives Pepino a way to take out his rage on the level's gimmicks, but this time around you're the one on the receiving end of the vengeful rampage. John Ghost takes an already tense escape and dials it up to 11 as you have to basically deal with a diet version of Pizza Face chasing you through the majority of the run back through the entrance. All in all, this level is just non-stop hits one after the other, all backed by the very unique Tombstone Arizona, which does a great job of mixing a haunting somber theme with hardcore western rock. This might be the lowest S tier, but don't let that fool you, because even from my first playthrough, this one struck me as expertly crafted and an exceptionally fun time, and with that in mind, it was a dead ringer for this prestigious placement. I'm a dis-
Superstar. Got a lot of money drive fancy cars. Okay, now it actually is time for Gnome Forest. This level was my introduction to World 3, and getting to experience it for the first time was definitely the moment this game went from having my interest to having my attention. About two or three rooms into the level, Pepino decides to take a well-deserved nap, and we are treated to a screen declaring that it's now the Gustavo and Brick Hour. Yup, that means a whole new pair of characters and a whole new moveset to learn. Thankfully, the game gives you a quick tutorial to get you acclimated with their various quirks, such as their ability to use double jumps to scale walls, or kicking brick to create a powerful projectile. It would have been nice if the tutorial were skippable on repeat playthroughs, but it's really not a big deal because it's pretty short and you can skip a decent amount of it by knowing how the characters work. These two have just enough new material to make them feel like a totally fresh experience, but there's enough overlap with Pepino in their kit that a lot of what they do still feels intuitive. Much like a perfectly cooked pizza, the balance here is just right. But what about Gnome Forest itself? Does it take advantage of what Gustavo and Brick bring to the table? Well, aside from the new playstyle, this level's new main gimmick is a pizza gnome that follows you around and you must deliver to houses in time before the pizza gets cold. The bad news? There's a lot of enemies in your way, and the path to the houses can be pretty daunting later on in the level, especially when you're fighting the urge to sidetrack and explore half the time. It's kind of like a more advanced version of the horse races from Fast Food Saloon. The winding structure of the level really does a great job of making it feel like you're truly stuck in the middle of an enormous forest, and the urgency presented by the pizza deliveries naturally encourages speedrunning, which also incentivizes you to familiarize yourself with the ins and outs of the new characters as quickly as possible. It's really impressive how well this level ties together. The delivery missions even continue into the escape sequence, so the grind truly does never quit for all three of this level's heroes. I also would be remiss if I didn't mention Woodpecker, the B theme of this level. I know quite a few people aren't very fond of this song, but for me it absolutely elevates the stage. It's one of those themes that's a lot better in actual gameplay than a standalone listen, and that's because the song's lackadaisical and borderline psychedelic nature perfectly complement the experience of playing as unfamiliar faces in a bizarre forest fantasy world full of wizards and bearded pizzas. It's a shame the A-theme's leitmotif is used for all the secret rooms, even though the song only plays for about 10% of the stage. This level is as well known as it is for good reason, because Gnome Forest is a spellbinding experience every single time I play it. Hold your butts! It's time for Jet Set Classic! Don't. Ever. For any reason. Do anything. To anyone. For any reason. Ever. No matter what. Refrigerator, Refrigerator, Freezerator, aka the level with both a ridiculously long title and a ridiculously long song name, has so much worth talking about that I hardly know where to begin. Remember a few minutes ago when I said one of the higher up levels is one that also has a lot wrong with it? Well, here it is. All throughout the first half of the level, the player is confronted with ice blocks that can only be destroyed using something heated, like by using these jetpacks, which I always thought were thermoses filled with hot water. And given how nicely that ties into the level's theming, I kinda wish that was the case in all honesty. The amount of speed you get on some of these narrow passageways early on can get kinda ridiculous in a good way. As you advance further inside the freezer, you'll be ambushed by none other than FAKE SANTA CLAUS! How dare he go around pretending to be the genuine thing, it's pretty shameful really. Anyways, the fake Santa will constantly bombard you with these snowman enemies, which are equal parts adorable and insufferable. I love the design of these guys, but they are also far and away my biggest problem with the level. Not only do they move very fast and have a hitbox directly in front of them, but they also can't be stunned by Mach 3. The worst part is that there's several instances toward the end of the level where you have to jump up through a pit filled with these enemies, and oftentimes there isn't really a super reliable way to cross this area safely. The bad news is that this is pretty questionable level design in an otherwise outstanding stage. But the good news is that this also makes what happens directly afterwards all the more satisfying. Pepino stumbles upon the Pepper Pizza, and becomes completely invincible and also gains the ability to spin upwards through the air as long as you hold the grab button. 
Oregano's fire mouth wishes it was half this cool. The ice blocks from before can also be melted by you when you're in this state. And once you take your pent up frustration and add on a few dozen snowmen, it's time to begin pizza time and blaze back through the course. That alone makes for one of the most satisfying conclusions to a level, but if you're up for a second lap then the game presents you with a new challenge, to do the escape sequence again, but this time as base form Pepino, which is a really clever way to keep the second lap experience from feeling stale. The three songs used throughout this level are all great themes and suit the areas they play in perfectly. Don't preheat your oven because if you do the song won't play encapsulates a sense of childlike wonder that comes with the joy of snow at wintertime. Celsius Troubles does a great job of ramping up the heat as the intensity of the level rises, and On the Rocks has this indomitable energy to it that trounces everything in its path, much like Pepino while the song plays. Although I do wish we got to hear a bit more of it before the pizza time song kicks in. While this level definitely has its fair share of flaws, and they're far more potent flaws than any other stage in S tier, the gimmicks that do hit their mark are so good that it's more than enough to get Freezerator out of the hot seat and let it chill comfortably as my fifth favorite pizza tower level. I've always enjoyed it when platformers aren't afraid to put a dystopian spin on things. Look at some of Sonic CD's Bad Future stages or Kirby Planet Robobot's mechanized take on Dreamland. Here in the Pig City, we have a town that's clearly seen better days as it's become polluted and overrun with pig thugs. Three of this level's main gimmicks are the grind rails that Pepino can slide around on, the rat balloons he can use to hitch a ride, and the new handcuff enemies that hold you in place until you're able to break out of them using Mach 3. Admittedly, that last one had me going for about two whole minutes before I finally figured out how to escape. There are also taxi cabs that show a neat little image of the drive before you're dropped off in a sub area where you can find some more toppings and secrets. Side note, but I really love it whenever Pizza Tower does one of these quick full screen cutaway drawings. It's effective as both a snappy comedic palette cleanser from the action, as well as a nice reminder of this game's stylization based on 90s cartoons like Ren and Stimpy. Anyways, Pig City is off to a fantastic start with all these fun gimmicks to mess around with, but then something happens about halfway through the level that might just be my favorite standalone moment in the entire game. That's right, Pepino is arrested and hauled off to jail, so guess who's back for a second serving of rat filled fun? Another Gustavo and Brick level had been something I really wanted ever since I finished Gnome Forest, and Pig City certainly delivered. The grind rails, rat balloons, and ham cuffs all operate completely differently for Gustavo than for Pepino, and it's really fun to see how the changes make the gameplay feel unique. For example, instead of using Mach 3 to break out of a ham cuff, only Brick is arrested, and Gustavo has to go solo until he can confront the enemy directly and rescue his friend. Tons of levels put fun little twists on gimmicks by having them placed in creative ways throughout the stage's terrain layout, or even having them bounce off of other unique aspects of the level. But I believe Pig City is the only one in the game to present you with a plethora of interesting set pieces and then flip them all on their head part way through by changing the one who's interacting with said gimmicks. The town also switches to become an even more hostile Chinatown run by shrimp gangsters when it's Gustavo's turn, and just when you think Pig City can't get any wilder, Pizza Time sets the whole place on fire. I did always find it kind of weird how it's Pizza Face that busts you out of jail here, but I guess this is just him letting Pepino go free so he can cause him more pain later? But that's just me reading way too far into the plot of a silly pizza game. Anyways, Bite the Crust is the perfect mix of foreboding and funky when it comes to setting the scene for this urban hellscape while Way of the Pig ramps the funkiness up even further, all while the newly introduced flute serves to remind us that we're in Chinatown now. In summary, while most levels in the game gave me a lot of fun with Pepino, and Gnome Forest hooked me on Gustavo and Brick's greatness, this level is the only one to give me the best of both worlds. Ordinarily, the Pig City would be a terrible place to spend the night, but I just can't help but keep coming back because I've never saw such an enjoyable level. Now it's time for the highest possible rank a level can achieve. This tier is reserved for the levels where perfection just doesn't cut it, 
they've straight up ascended to godhood. If you are looking for some of the most fun possible in any 2D platformer, I am of the opinion that you'd be pretty hard pressed to find a more enjoyable experience than what these top three levels have to offer. So the time has finally come to begin the P tier. All living things kneel before your master. You have no idea. I've been back on the beach the whole time. I already mentioned how Gnome Forest was the first level I played in World 3, and as much of a blast as I had with that one, I had no clue that the very next stage I played would immediately blow it out of the water. Cannonball's optional. If Forest was the moment the game went from having my interest to having my attention, then it was Crust Cove where the game went from having my attention to having my admiration. This stage is a symphony where everything comes together to create a truly refreshing and memorable platforming experience. You start out inside a cave, and after a quick climb to the surface, you find yourself face to face with a scenic beach at sunset and are confronted with the first of many enjoyable quirks of this level, the dangerous water. The introductory segment for this gimmick is nothing short of inspired. Basically, after a few pretty simple stretches of the deadly water, you're given a choice between an enemy-filled upper route or the bottom path with the new water gimmick. Slow down even a little bit on the lower route and you're going to get nipped straight up to the upper deck. But the only way to get the first top end of the level is by successfully clearing the lower route. It's the perfect way to teach the player the mechanic by utilizing well measured amounts of positive and negative reinforcement. And this section is essentially a perfect microcosm of Crush Cove as a whole. The next part of the level sees you boarding a cruise ship heavily guarded by cannon pizza goblins enemies who will become an increasingly dangerous threat as the stage progresses. Anyways, it's in this cruise ship that we are introduced to the level's transformation gimmick, the barrel. Oh, how I love this barrel. It's a great representation of the old saying, less is more. Basically, when you're in this barrel and hold the run button, you start rolling in whatever direction you're facing. And once you start rolling, good luck, because all you can really do is jump and hope for the best. After the barrel essentially turns your controls into Geometry Dash, the level becomes a bit of a barrel skate park where you can get a feel for the physics and learn the timing of the jumps. It won't be long until Pepino's back outside, and this time he's not alone because the captain of the Cannon Pizza Goblins is here to make you walk the plank. Okay, but actually he fires cannonballs that are telegraphed by reticles that appear on your screen. It takes a previously serene beach setting and makes things super hectic and I love it. The cannon gimmick also adds some new life to the water gimmick from earlier, because now there will be rocks jutting out that you normally might stop on to be safe from the water, but nope, the pirate's firing right at those rocks so you'd better get moving. After thwarting the captain, you'll fall back down to the cove setting from the very start of the level, where some rapids will whisk you face to face with the level's final new gimmick, the cannon goblin bots. They're just like cannon pizza goblins except completely indestructible, so your best chance at enduring them is to parry their shots. After some more barrel shenanigans and trouble from the goblins, pizza time finally kicks in, and it begins with the mother of all barrel challenges. You better hope you learned something from the previous barrel sections, because one slip up here and you're going straight back down to the bottom, and time is no longer an indefinite resource. On my first attempt at this level, it took me about a minute and a half just to make it out of this room. It was incredibly frustrating, but also a lot of fun. Later on in the escape you find another barrel and have to use it to dodge cannon fire from the goblin captain again. After another mad dash over the dangerous water and a scurry back down the cave, you're done with one of the most creative and tightly designed beach stages ever made in a video game. I promise not to give a full in-depth play-by-play with the last two levels, it's just that Cove in particular has so many unique environments and gimmicks going on that it didn't really feel right to rob my explanation of the full level's context that made it such a fun adventure for me. And so without further ado, let's see which level is even better than that and took my silver medal for pizza tower levels. I'm kidding. Did you really think I wasn't going to bring up Tropical Crust, one of the best songs in a game where every song is a banger? The sheer summertime vibrancy and playfulness that this tune delivers in the funkiest way imaginable makes it impossible for me to play this level with the sound off. 
The main melody really makes you feel like you're at a beach party with friends, while the more relaxed portions of the song have a hint of intrigue and mystery to them that perfectly suits Peppino's misadventures in the ship and cave. Massive props to Mr. Saucemen for creating this amazing song. Okay, now it's really time to move on to number two. Be careful not to make a sound! If you tried to tell past me that one of the best levels in all of Pizza Tower was a stealth horror level where the punishments for being caught are chase sequences that can lead to FNAF inspired jump scares, then I probably would have believed you, honestly. I mean, I really stopped being surprised at the unique level concepts they could successfully pull off after I played the golf level and it was somehow pretty solid. But even if the extensive Tour de Pizza's Madness are something I had gotten used to by World 5, that's not to say that I was any less caught off guard by how thoroughly distinct and utterly genius of a level Don't Hug Me I'm- Are you kidding me? I really put Don't Hug Me I'm Scared as the level name in the script? Alright guys, I gotta take five after that one, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't Make a Sound is a level with a singular unifying gimmick, the Toppin' Monsters. If one of the surveillance enemies sees you, a countdown will begin, and a Toppin' Monster will be alerted to chase you until you're either caught or escape the room safely. There's four different varieties of them you'll encounter. A mushroom animatronic monster that chases quickly in a straight line, a cheese blob monster that can stick to surfaces to hunt you down, a tomato puppet monster that can float freely around, and a sausage slasher monster who can slice through obstacles in front of him while in pursuit. Get caught by a monster and you're in for a jump scare and a few seconds stuck as an animatronic Peppino where you continuously lose points. The different movement styles of the monsters forces the player to constantly adapt to increasingly difficult chase sequences. There will even be times where there is no other option but to trigger the alarm, which means you have to be ready to switch from stealth mode to escape mode at a moment's notice. If I had to rank the Toppin' Monsters from worst to best, last place would definitely go to Sausage. The whole outlet destruction thing he can do is pretty neat, but the actual jump scare is without a doubt the weakest of the bunch. Third place goes to the Cheese Monster. His sticky abilities can make him one of the harder ones to avoid, and the jump scare is a little bit unsettling. Second place is Tomato Monster. The floating movement pattern can make it really tough to get rid of him, and it's probably one of the spookiest jump scares of the quartet. First place goes to Mushroom Monster. The jump scare itself is actually pretty weak, but I just really like his design, and it's really funny to me how he just constantly gets thwarted throughout his chase scenes, like falling down the pit that leads to the first secret, or getting blocked off by a giant wall. It can be kind of easy to forget about him during pizza time though, so in a way he does get the last laugh if you're not careful. The best jump scare in the game is easily Oktoberfest though, but like come on, was there ever any doubt? Anyways, as you make it towards the end of the level, there's a long intense chase scene where you have to run from all four Toppin' Monsters at once, which means guess what? Peppino's getting cornered again, just like in Freezerator. Only this time around, instead of using a special pizza, Peppino just straight up grabs a shotgun, and it's crazy how satisfying it feels to pick up this thing and finally get to blast those goons away. But now that you have the means to put the specters down, you've gotta escape the pizzeria before Pizza Face gets added to the list of monsters trying to track you down and kill you. But wait, there's more! Introducing Pineapple Elvis! I'm not even going to pretend to understand what's going on anymore, but I am loving every second of it. Basically, this new monster, Pineapple Elvis, has the ability to trigger the other monsters at will without even needing you to get spotted by the patrollers, which means you need to still be really careful even with your trusty new Peacemaker. I love this level so much. The stealth segments are very well designed. The Toppin' Monsters and their jump scares aren't the most frightening thing in the world, but they're still pretty creepy and retain the trademark silliness that makes this game so entertaining. And this symphony of a 10 out of 10 level is brought to a close perfectly by a very cathartic pizza time sequence. There are three other quick things I want to mention about this stage before moving on to my number one pick. Firstly, the sticky floor. Don't think I forgot about it. It's a great side gimmick that effectively hampers your movement to help making escaping the monsters just a bit more challenging, and I'm all for it. Secondly, the music. 
Tunnelly Shimbers and Hard Drive to Munchu are a sublime power couple of songs that highlight this level's eerie nature and the overwhelming dread of the pursuit sequences respectively. Lastly, the title card. I don't usually bring these up, but this one is easily one of my favorites, so I just want to shout it out real quick. The juxtaposition of Pepino nervously frolicking alongside the happy Toppin monsters with the chilling font of the title in the bottom left corner does a perfect job of setting the scene for a kid's pizzeria that harbors unspeakable horrors just beneath the surface. Most of the other title cards show Pepino apprehensively facing a grotesquely realistic version of the level's challenges, but one look at this card and you immediately know something's off because you've been presented with the opposite extreme of the norm. It's inspired. I could go on and on about Don't Make a Sound all day, but the time has finally come to talk about my number one level, the head honcho, the king of all pizza tower stages. I alone will stand at the top. It's the tutorial! What else could it have possibly been? You thought John Gutter was a good intro stage? Well, compared to the tutorial, it might as well go in the gutter. The skill ceiling is so high for the tutorial that no player has ever achieved a P rank for the level yet, and that's honestly mind-blowing. The gimmick of Pizza Granny shouting at you exactly what you need to do next to progress is borderline Shakespearean with how beautifully symbolic it is of the game's controls. And of course you have the life-changing sounds of Funakuli Holiday backing it all, a truly awe-inspiring musical number that changed history so profoundly that mankind invented time travel and added the melody into Spider-Man 2 nearly 20 years in the past! <sighs> okay fine, it's time for the real number one. Space. The final frontier. I knew from the first second I came in through the entrance door that this level would be one of, if not the best stages in the entire game. That's the power of the overwhelming aura of awesomeness that Deep Dish 9 exudes. The diverse array of backgrounds on this level are so unlike anything else in the game, they're totally mesmerizing. One of them has a giant gorilla head with ooze coming out of its eyes and roots coming out of its neck. And it just perfectly drives home the feeling that you're not just in an unknown city or a strange forest, but an entirely foreign world to what you've become familiar with. And then there's Extraterrestrial Wawaz, which is quite easily my favorite song in the entire game. Even on a standalone listen, it never fails to transport me right back to Pino's wild planet hopping expedition through the use of heavenly guitar riffs, which sounds so utterly transcendent that the song is named after them. If that wasn't enough, a later section of the song is extremely reminiscent of the song Aerodynamic by Daft Punk, French house artists that are not only known for creating highly rhythmic and sample heavy music much like the Pizza Tower soundtrack, but they also had a movie called Interstellar 5555. This film tells the story of a kidnapped band of alien rock stars and their journey to get back to their home planet. It's also a visual companion to Daft Punk's Discovery album. Which means that not very far into the movie, you hear... You guessed it, Aerodynamic. So to say that referencing that song in Extraterrestrial Was was a good idea is an understatement. But all these pretty sights and sounds would mean absolutely nothing if the level design wasn't strong enough to back it all up. And fortunately, both the layout and gimmicks bring preposterous amounts of fun to Deep Dish 9. The rideable rockets take a lot of good spacing to steer properly due to how wild they are, and it feels really fun to barrel through everything with them and even get some airtime on occasion. And yeah, it's true that War also has the rockets, but War lacks a key companion to them that makes them much more fleshed out, the asteroids. These giant fellows not only have great thematic synergy with the rockets, but they're also a creative way to add a bit more complexity to the exploration of the level. The anti-gravitational olives might actually be my favorite gimmick of the bunch though, because of how creative the shifting gravity allows the level to get sometimes. It's not just, oh, unplug your brain and use the olive to go up, because sometimes there's a such thing as going too high, and you'll miss a valuable collectible. Adding on to the trend of spatial manipulation are the pizza teleporters, which can instantly send you somewhere else in the level. It's gimmicks like these that make this such an enjoyable and smooth stage to play through. And it's not just the main three either. Both planets also have their own specific side gimmicks to further sell that they're their own little worlds. Like the grassy planet having the lava floor and the cheese planet making frequent usage of destructible terrain. 
and the transition between these areas wouldn't be nearly as enjoyable without the space shuttle, which plays a funny little cutscene of Peppino absolutely losing it on the ride over. To me, this level is just completely unmatched when it comes to providing speed filled thrills and treating your eyes and ears while doing so. And what more could you possibly ask for in a pizza tower level? Deep Dish 9 is truly an out of this world experience every single time I play it. So there you have it. This has been my ranking of every single pizza tower level. This video took me far longer to make than anything else I've created in the history of my channel, but I'd also say this was the most fun I had working on a video as well. If you enjoyed watching it, then at the risk of sounding cliche, please consider dropping a like or subscribing, because that lets me know that this is the kind of video people would like to see more of. Anyways, Pizza Tower left such a huge influence on me, I started playing it at a very stressful time in my life. And some days it just really helped to focus that stress into beating up a bunch of unsuspecting food related monsters. I also just really like making ranking style videos, so you might end up seeing some more of those down the road. As for Pizza Tower videos, I don't really think I can or should try and turn it into an ongoing series on the channel, just by virtue of how comprehensive I intentionally made this one. But like I said in the beginning, if you guys like this video enough, I might do a boss ranking later on. Or maybe I could rank the title cards, and who knows, if we ever get like DLC levels or something like that, I might end up giving my two cents on them. Huge shout out to P.O. Trek for letting me use his footage throughout this project, as well as everyone else whose work I used, they've all been credited down below. But with that said, I believe I am finally out of things to say about the bizarre escapades of the Italian pizza chef, so thank you all so much for staying until the very end, and I will see you next time.